it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce the second speakers um, for the next session, Sai um, Gori Sanker and Roman Sarat. And they are both postdocs at Stanford University with uh, Nat Gray. Uh, rather than introducing them one by one, I'm going to try to introduce them at the same time because I found um, they have Thanks. some very interesting experience um, that are contrasting with each other. They have very different passes before co this collaboration, as you will hear in the following introductions. So both Sai and Rome have uh, a very strong background in chemistry, where Rome was uh, mainly trained in uh, Switzerland and performed his PhD study in UTH Zurich, whereas um, he focused on fluorescence as well as photo switchable probes. Sai actually was mainly trained in the United States and performed his thesis research at Stanford University, where he focused on ATP um, chromatin ray modelers. So both of them are very highly active in teaching, mentoring, as well as multiple outreach activities, and they have won a lot of awards and fired a lot of patents. But one thing I found interesting was uh, Ron actually served as the president for Zurich um, Tennis Sport Club. And at around the same time, Sai served as president for Stanford Biotechnology Group. So you can see commonality there. But where Sai has a lot of industry experience, Rome does not have that experience, but he actually served in military for some time, which are kind of uniqueness of that. So I'm kind of curious um, how two of you come together um, to study following um, these kinases for transcription factors. And I'm excited for your talk to um, kind of introducing how to turn in the kinase inhibitors into lineage-specific activators of transcription. Thank you, um, you for uh, giving the talks. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you for such a detailed introduction. Yeah, it's really a, an honor to share our work today. I've been following this community since I was in, in grad school, since um, in Jerry Crabtree's lab as, as a you know, studying chromatin modeling, and it's it's you know an honor to present today a work that uh, really kind of integrates new approaches from medicinal chemistry uh, as well as chromatin biology, and sort of reflecting that interdisciplinary nature. Uh, Roman and I will just um, bounce back and forth throughout the presentation, uh, and and the the story and the project actually uh, takes a step back from chromatin and and begins with an observation or recognition we had about a cell death and and the fact that every cell in our bodies and in or in multicellular organisms contains an intrinsic cell death pathway these are conserved biochemical signaling uh, pathways in many cases conserved from worms to flies to humans they uh, organize our normal patterns of development for example in a fetus of course we're born with uh, we have webbing and that's successively pruned away by the process of cell death to give us the digits that we have um, when we emerge. And, and of course, uh, cell death pathways uh, allow um, cancer cells, among other disease cells, to respond to DNA damage and stress and commit uh, apoptosis or growth arrest. Uh, Ro uh, Roman and I are in the Stanford Cancer Institute and Nathaniel Gray's laboratory in, in uh, chemical systems biology here at Stanford. And we think a lot about therapeutic strategies and modalities to, to target cancer. and so. Thinking about a uh, program cell death in this fashion, we, um, uh, we we had the question that's sort of the heart of this story. Can we hijack the biochemical signals that ordinarily regulate the expression of proliferation, survival, invasion, or metastasis of a cancer cell and force those signals instead to turn on the pathways responsible for apoptosis or, or growth arrest in a, in a cancer cell? Directly sort of uh, hijacking cancer drivers to, to turn on cell death. Uh, and, and the concept we came up to do this uh, went back to uh, now chromatin. And we said, well, what if we could take uh, a small molecule that on one side recruits a cancer driving epigenetic activator? So this could be a transcription factor that ordinarily stimulates um, uh, an expression of a proliferation gene. It could be an oncogene itself, like MYC, for example. And now recruit it to the promoters of genes that are, uh, that are responsible for program cell death, that are bound by a so-called death regulatory transcription factor. 
And uh, this would all occur in a genetically unmodified cell and or, or cellular organism. And the only uh, thing we would introduce into the system would be a bivalent small molecule that has these two binding moieties on either side, one to the epigenetic activator and the other to the death regulatory transcription factor, in effect, rewiring those drivers to then activate the expression of programmed cell death. Uh, to, of course, make this strategy work, uh, we needed a, you know, a transcription factor that regulates program cell death. And through a lot of analysis of tumor sequencing data that's been collected over the last decade or so, we came up uh, upon one such transcription factor, BCL6 or B-cell lymphoma 6. This factor is highly deregulated a number of diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. Uh, its overexpression uh, is, is common in, in those cancers. And you can see it here on a chip sequencing track sitting on one such cell suicide gene called Harakiri. Uh, I think you can guess what you know Harakiri expression does to the cell. And so what is BCL6, this transcription factor that regulates cell death? Uh, a number of really elegant studies have been performed by uh, many labs over, over the decades that have given us uh, the molecular biology behind how BCL6 operates. It turns out BCL6 binds with a zinc finger domain at a DNA recognition element upstream of a variety of cell death expression programs and suppresses their expression by associating with an N-terminal BTB domain in red here with a number of co-repressors, components of polycomorphism complexes one, uh, also associates with histone deacetylases, for example. So it ordinarily in a normal cell setting silences the expression of apoptotic gene expression. And so I think you can imagine how the overexpression of this factor and its deregulation in cancer settings allows these cells to continue to proliferate when otherwise they might shut down. Um, over the last you know, five years or so, uh, targeting BCL6 has become sort of a cottage industry in the biotechnology or the pharmaceutical industry, and a number of really high affinity molecules have been made to bind to this BTB domain pocket of BCL6 and try to displace those co-repressors from binding to BCL6. And these have you know, nanomolar potencies in some cases. They do a great job at displacing those repressors from binding to the BCL6 transcription factor. But on their own, they have rather modest effects on actually turning on the expression of cell death genes and uh, activating anti-tumor uh, tumor effects. And so our strategy was something like the following. We said, well, what if we could make a switch now using a small molecule to basically switch BCL6 from repressing transcription of cell death to turning on transcription of cell death? And so the idea was something like the following. We could take molecules made to bind to those repressor domains of BCL6 and covalently attach them now to molecules to epigenetic co-activators that we know from our studies of chromatin are many in the cell. And so then the strategy would look something like this. The bivalent molecule would go on one side, displace those epigenetic repressors from BCL6, derepress transcription. And this is about as far as how you would get to if you just had that inhibitor in hand and how those inhibitors have been working. And now, of course, you know the other side of this dumbbell-shaped molecule would recruit a fraction of the cell's co-activator pool to then actively turn on the transcription of cell death, uh, sort of, you know, not just take the break off BCL6's uh, regulation of cell death program, but actively push, you know, the accelerator and, and turn on uh, cell death expression and, and kill the cancer cell. And so uh, this strategy we've been, uh, we recognize could be used to sort of um, rewire a number of different diverse chromatin processes. We call these molecules transcriptional chemical inducers of proximity uh, or TSIPs for, for short because they rely on this induced proximity of the co-activator with the BCL6 transcription factor. A first uh, story actually uh, uh, hijacked the elongation factor BRD4 to activate the expression of a program cell death genes. And in the rest, remainder of this talk and the story we want to focus on today, uh, we uh, took advantage of transcriptional kinases, CDK9, 12, and 13, to achieve the same outcome. Yeah, exactly. And uh, CDK9 is, is really a representative of kinases as a privileged drug target in oncology overall. We were interested in CDK9 in particular because it is a ubiquitous um, transcriptional regulator and activator that forms together with its uh, cyclin T binding partners to PTFB complex that is at least canonically understood to phosphorylate the C-terminal domain of polymerase 2 to cause pause release. So in some activate transcription, right? And so what we asked is, can we make and design bivalent molecules, we term them CDK T SIPs uh, in this case, to recruit CDK9 and its activity to BCL6 bound loci, usurp the usual repressive function of BCL6, facilitate uh, the transcription of downstream death genes, and hopefully potently kill 
um, lymphoma cells that depend on BCL6 expression. And so the challenge was, at least uh, at first, really to make these CDK T set molecules. And that's um, how our background in chemistry came in handy. We actually made a very large library of, of compounds, bivalent compounds, as indicated here, that link structurally diverse binders of the BCL6 B2B domain here on the left, and uh, structurally diverse uh, ATP competitive inhibitors of CDK9. On the right, uh, we made a total of about 100 compounds, and I'm jumping a lot of steps, but we nominated uh, an early lead compound uh, here in red, CDKT1, which links this Bering Ingelheim BTB binder BI3812 to the SNS032 CDK9 inhibitor that the Gray Lab had previously used for the greater studies. We also made two structurally closely related negative controls, NEG1 and NEG2, shown below. They both bear structurally structural modifications in red that uh, negate interaction with BCL6 or CDK9, respectively. And at first, we used uh, a reporter cell line that employs a GFP or a plasmid that has a GFP in downstream of BCL6 binding motifs, used that plasmid in BCL6 overexpressing cells. And when we incubated these cells with CDK T set one, as you can see in this plot, we saw robust uh, activation of green fluorescence, indicating that indeed CDK T sep one can activate transcription in the system, whereas the two negative controls in gray did not. So this told us two early but very important findings. First, uh, we probably need dual engagement of the two proteins, CDK9 and BCL6, for this phenotype. And maybe more importantly, we are indeed able to use chemically induced proximity to turn an ATP competitive inhibitor of CDK9, which should downregulate and inhibit transcription, into a locus specific activator of transcription. And we did a lot of profilings. Oh, and I should first say, um, this was not a phenomenon that was limited to the SNS032 uh, binder of CDK9. And indeed, we could convert uh, many uh, structurally diverse uh, and preclinical CDK9 inhibitors, for example, here on the first level AT7519, but also ACD4573, into bivalent compounds that no longer act as inhibitors, global inhibitors of CDK9, but instead activate GFP expression in this reporter. And we can do this predictively based on the ability of these compounds to get into cells and form a ternary complex between BCL6 and CDK9, as shown here in this uh, nanobred um, data. And for example, another compound based on a Novartis NVP2 uh, CDK9 inhibitor that does not activate transcription at all does not form um, a ternary complex in cells either. Now, going back to our lead compound, CDK TCIP1 in red on the bottom right, we found that it actually not, that, that doesn't just activate transcription of these death genes or of GFP at this point uh, at low uh, nanomolar concentrations. It also kills such BCL6 overexpressing cells at single digit nanomolar concentrations. And this activity is constrained or has high specificity for such cells, we collaborated with the PRISM Consortium at the Broad Institute, where they uh, screen drug sensitivities in almost 900 cancer cell lineages, and we found unique and specific activity in those cancer cells that depend on BCL6 overexpression. So we have found something that is not just potent, but very specific. And because of this specific effect of our molecule on transcription and on BCL6 processes, we asked whether possibly we could study BCL6 biology or modulate BCL6 biology uh, in vivo, in rodent models of immunization, to be precise. And as you can see here, we had to develop a, an optimized molecule for this. Again, our chemistry background coming in handy. Uh, we still needed to improve uh, the physical chemical properties and metabolic stability to go into mice. Now, I should say quickly that we looked at uh, ablation of germinal center B cells. Germinal center B cells are the normal cells that have the highest level um, of BCL6 and also use that overexpression of BCL6 to stay allow, uh, to, to continue to proliferate. Um, and they're in very in many ways the counterpart of DLB cell cells. And in studies that were performed by Hao Peng Yang and uh, Michael Green at MD Anderson, we were you know, gratifyingly found that indeed this compound CDK T-CYP2 
does reduce and inhibit, inhibit the formation of these germinal center B cells in a dose-dependent manner. Uh, the best results we found actually at the twice daily dosing regime to the right, uh, most likely because this drug still has a, a half-life that was about three hours, so not very long. Now, crucially though, in contrast to other B cell targeting uh, therapies that tend to kill all B cell populations, we saw no effect on naive and also memory B cells, which again, of course, is, is a, a evidence for this exquisite specificity that we have found. And, and that's you know nice uh, in terms of uh, looking forward for possible therapeutic applications. At that point, we saw no um, ad adverse toxicity or body weight loss. So I, so I think the, the question has now become, after those studies, uh, we turned a CDK9 inhibitor and essential transcriptional kinase and molecules that were that are made and optimized to ordinarily shut down transcription in all cells into this explicitly sort of lineage-specific activator of a process. And we wanted to understand a little bit better of how this was happening. And so here we turn back to you know, what was happening on endogenous chromatin in our lymphoma cell setting. And so the first thing we did here is we did a you know CDK9 chip seek experiment after adding our compound for a short time point for two hours at you know at acute drug concentration, 30 nanomolar. And we could see exactly sort of as we hypothesized with our model that I showed you previously, the specific recruitment of CDK9 to BCL6 target genes here annotated by genes uh, with BCL6 summits at their promoter, and as well as, as BCL6 enrichment increased at a locus, as more BCL6 was bound there, we could see correspondingly higher amounts of CDK9 being recruited to that locus, suggesting that this model of forming this complex of a transcription factor, and now this kinase CDK9 on, on chromatin was actually happening in an in a endogenous chromatin setting. And now, of course, CDK9 is this kinase, and that's uh, and its canonical substrate is a C-terminal domain of uh, of polymerase, RNA polymerase two, among many other substrates. And so, we did a chip sequencing experiment for serine two phosphorylation of RNA polymerase two, again at these same time points at drug concentrations. And we were uh, we we were surprised and also gratified to see this specific serine two phosphorylation phenotype exactly at those same summit sites where CDK9 was recruited to at those BCL6 bound summits. So basically, in short, at at loci where BCL6 binds, not only do we recruit CDK9, but we also observe this specific serine two phosphorylation at polymerase that's bound already at at those loci. And so our, our model then is something like this. We're recruiting CDK9 to BCL6 bound chromatin, and it's uh, and we're somehow releasing a little bit of it, which I'll come back to in a few slides, to phosphorylate polymerase that's already paused there downstream of the transcription factor. And so this results, as you might expect, on a trans in a transcriptomic analysis in this dose-dependent change in transcription of, uh, of BCL6 target genes. So this is programmatic activation of the entire BCL6 pathway, not just one pro-epiptotic gene that it regulates, not just, for example, Harakiri, but also NOXA, a number of cell cycle arrest genes, a number of DNA damage response genes, and so on. Um, and you know, from a from a sort of a cancer biology perspective, this was especially interesting to us because it promises uh, an opportunity for a cell, a fewer opportunities for a cell to develop resistance to, for example, as compared to a specific uh, targeted uh, therapeutic that maybe uh, targets only one particular apoptotic process. And so we're ex examining those models of resistance further. But I think uh, in in combined with this analysis, the the sort of elephant in the room is. You know, how were we able to turn uh, molecules that were originally made to inhibit the active site of this kinase into now activating a specific process? How does CDK9 recruitment using ATP competitive inhibitors sort of, you know, grabbing uh, this kinase by the mouth, I guess, as if it was, an, you know, uh, to allow for RNA um, polymerase phosphorylation? And so to examine this question a little bit further, we built a synthetic system uh, where we now tagged CDK9 with a, a ligand binding tag called FKBP12 F36V. And this tag binds another molecule, a synthetic ligand of FKBP, that now allows you to recruit the kinase in proximity with BCL6 without inhibiting its catalytic activity. And we can make mutations or so on to the kinase as well. And so that's that's what we did. And we we built this system in a in our BCL6 reporter cell lines. Uh, synthesized a molecule that was able to recruit CDK9 now with, without with, with by its tag to BCL6 bound genes and looked on its effect on transcription. And the first 
uh, uh, effect we saw in the same reporter cell system is that indeed uh, induced proximity of CDK9 was sufficient for induction of our uh, GFP controlled by BCL6 binding sites. So in short, CDK9 recruitment using induced proximity is sufficient to turn on transcription. And then strikingly, uh, what we observed then is that we made a mutation in the catalytic site of CDK9, uh, removing its ability to, to phosphorylate uh, polymerase or any other substrate, this uh, activity on transcription was drastically reduced. And so in short, induced proximity was sufficient for gene induction, but uh, we also uh, you also require the catalytic activity of CDK9 to be, act to be present. And so we did a, a number of other biochemical studies and so on uh, that uh, ended up uh, leading us to our sort of current working model of how these bivalent molecules were able to turn uh, inhibitors into now a lineage specific activator of a process. And so our model was something like the following where we were able to recruit a fraction of the endogenous kinase population to BCL6 bound genes to turn on their expression and activate apoptosis in the cancer cell. Uh, and then these molecules, of course, are not covalent. They have a certain off rate with their kinase binding partner. And that off rate now permits the kinase to, be, to go free and, and phosphorylate its substrate that may be in local proximity of the transcription factor bound in some uh, allowing this lineage specific redirection of an essential kinase now in, in cells very specifically that depend on BCL6 uh, at, at low occupancy of either par partner. Uh, we should note that, uh, you know, in, in coming up with this model, um, we uh, realized that there was some precedent for recruiting activity of an enzyme using a substrate competitive inhibitor. We realized, for example, that similar studies had found use, that they could recruit histone deacetylase activity, for example, by, by histone deacetylase inhibitors at a targeted loci. And so we feel that this is something a little bit general that could, we could use induced proximity to turn inhibitors of an enzyme, in this particular case, a kinase, into activators of a particular signaling process. And to explore that further, Exactly. Um, we wanted to look what other kinases we we might actually hijack um, because there's obviously, uh, you know, they're one of the most privileged drug classes. And we first started looking into CK12 and 13 because they play, you know, similar roles as CDK9 in regulating transcription. And in an analogous fashion, we made a molecule that now uh, binds selectively CDK12 and 13 on one end and on the other end um, exhibits the same bi 12 BTB domain binder and found that this molecule yet again can induce GFB expression in our, in our BCL6 dependent reporter. And kill BCL6 overexpressing cell lines more potently than even the additive effect of CDK12 and 13 and BCL6 inhibition. And so what we feel like is that we can now go, hopefully, or the field can now hopefully use the vast array and the vast chemical space of ATP competitive kinase inhibitors, turn them into inducers of proximity and use them hopefully for new therapeutic applications, such as, for example, rewiring transcription. Yeah. And so in total, in, in summary, I think, uh, I hope we were able to convey that we can use chemically induced proximity to turn kinase inhibitors into context-specific activators of transcription. And CDK TCEP1 really doesn't work uh, in a, uh, a, a target-centric inhibition way, but rather by activating in a programmatic fashion an entire signaling pathway. Um, we were also able to show that CDK TCEPs can be rationally optimized through medicinal chemistry to make them amenable for modulating BCL6 in in vivo. And we're excited to study those molecules in, you know, in models of cancer, but also of, of inflammation. And uh, just now uh, we showed you that this uh, concept uh, extends beyond CDK to at least CDK12 and 13. And we hope and think much beyond that. And with this, um, I think we would like to thank everybody involved. It takes it takes a village, right? Uh, predominantly Jerry Crabtree and Nat Gray as, as their supervisor, Basil Karim, uh, who call it the study with us. And uh, everyone who attended today, it's it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for this opportunity.
Oh, thank you both for the wonderful talk. So um, if you have any questions, um, please type them in Q&A box or raise your hand so that we can uh, mute you for um, ask, um, asking questions directly. So the first question you got is, um, thank you for the great talk. Have you tested your compounds in the patient and cells? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're conducting some of those patient derived xenograft, uh, studies currently. Yeah. So it's, it's ongoing. Uh, that's what I could say. Yeah. You could, the lymphocytes, right? So we, we did test the molecules on, on primary patient derived lymphocytes oh, already that we, we mm -hmm. kind of use this as a benchmark for, for toxicity, for channel toxicity and found very moderate effects and a considerable window of about three orders of a magnitude of potency between killing lymphoma and, uh, primary lymphocytes. So I guess in your talk, you um, and also in your current research, you kind of focus on the CDKs. Um, how about other ones that can do these things for like C-terminus of PAL2? Is there any thing that is better than CDKs that you can target rather than like in terms of like, um, like how about the compound availability or oral availability, et cetera? Yeah. Ah uh, yeah, yeah. We uh we started actually this project with with another elongation associated, not a kinase, but elongation associated factor. Uh, this bet domain factor BRD four, and that was very potent. Mm -hmm. And we have achieved some oral availability and different chemical, you know, better chemical properties for that compound. And then, as you can imagine, there are a number of different chromatin remodelers and chromatin modifiers. Uh, many of which have ligands, such as those histone acetyl transferases, for example. Uh, and we we've been uh, you know, reasonably successful at, at using each one of those then to modulate uh, gene expression at, uh, in a similar manner. Not, not you know, for example, phosphor to C-terminal domain of polymerase, but perhaps, you know, locally increased accessibility uh, on, a, on, a, on a transcription factor bound site, for example. Um, yeah, so, so I, I, yeah, we think that the, the concept of sort of rewiring transcription using, you know, induced proximity is, is certainly, you know, broader than just the, the kinases that we showed. So I guess it's just not the kinase, it's the best target. It's like, um, I guess with other, com other components, you see similar effects. Yeah, I in think terms of like activating the apoptosis genes. Yes. Yeah, I think what constitutes the best activator, the, the jury is still very much out. Um, mm -hmm. But as you've hinted at, right, there's a you know there's many other kinases that we might and partly also are exploring, right? Um, for now, we're definitely mostly focusing on, on nuclear kinases. Um, CDK so far have definitely worked best. I think we can say. So you got a alumni from uh, Crabtree Lab to ask you a question. So have you tried the drug uh, on the lymphoblastoid cell lines as they strongly depend on inhibition of apoptosis by EBV proteins? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I don't think we have, yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, and uh, then um, we got a question, raise the hand from Jackson, who is going to ask a question directly. Hey guys, that was really great. And the uh, the data showing the phosphorylation of Paul 2 I think, is really fascinating. And I was wondering if you played around with any of your different, like the different ligands you've designed to see if you have uh, ligands with different affinity for the active site of CDK9, if they would have more or less ability to phosphorylate fault two. Well, we have profiled biochemical inhibitory potency of those compounds, and they're surprisingly similar. So uh, we don't think it's the bivalent affinity differences that drive this. It's at least partially. So the broad distinction between uh, molecule classes certainly is, as we showed, uh, their their ability to go into cells A and B, then also form a ternary complex. Now there's of course uh, a sample or, or um, samples of, of productive and non-productive uh, ternary complexes. We think, even though um, now I need to. Uh, 
Like, can you help me? Uh, so no, the true we haven't done this with many other ligands yet. Right? I, well, I, I think I think what you're asking is, you know, are molecules mm -hmm. that are are stronger inhibitors of CDK9 oh. are they able to, oh. you know, uh, have the same effect or the reduced effects? And certainly, uh, certainly, we have not looked at polymerase phosphorylation, but we've just just looked at transcription in our reporter system and profiled, you know, a, a number of those dozens, and and that's exactly the trend we see and and. Uh, as as we'd expect, the I think the complication that that Roman you're referring to is is that of course when you change the inhibitory potencies of molecules, you're changing the chemical structure substantially and and uh, teasing out the you know the effect of that difference in chemical structure on you know stability and permeability and so on from the inhibitory effect is is uh, it makes the makes a clear conclusion not so satisfactory, but but the trend is is exactly what we hypothesize. Yeah. Great, and uh, thank you for, uh, for the wonderful talks. I thought the transition was very natural between both of you. <laughs> all right. Um, oh, yeah, thank you all for coming to the seminar, and let's thank all the three speakers for the wonderful seminar.